good afternoon. Uh, how, how are you holding up with the passing of Stephen Hawking? Council member, it is, I am so glad that you mentioned that. I had the privilege, I, I studied physics at Cooper Union and many years ago, and had the privilege of meeting Stephen Hawking, and he is one of the geniuses of our time, um, coupled with a wit. Um, I think not only has he expanded the boundaries of science, but he has also, he was a living testament to the fact that disabilities are just different abilities. Uh, I, I never got to meet him. I've read all of his work, at least uh, the, for, for the general public. I haven't read his academic work as per se, but uh, thank you for bringing your science background to government. We need more of that. I also want to thank you for your partnership. Just to share with my colleague, uh, uh, Reynoso, I, I have uh, ha had protests about issues that were before Department of City Planning and uh, then had Department of City Planning meet with us the same day. Uh, and appreciate the commitment to having an ongoing dialogue where we've been able to get to resolution. Uh, I want to just touch on quick four items. Uh, in 2017, we were able, able to pass Local Law 101 relating to having a Board of Standards and Appeals Coordinator at DCP. Uh, and uh, you have complying to an extent by posting on a page on your large site called uh, mandatory mandated and other notices uh, that a person not the name but just their email n Vargas uh, has been assigned so if you could share that person's name and consider creating a dedicated board of standards and appeals uh, page uh, that would be helpful and even to explain to people what this agency that no one has ever heard of and is yet uh, more powerful than city planning. <laughs> um, I would be glad to share the person's name. Um, she is a member of our zoning division, Nicole Vargas. Um, I actually think that it is better not to put a particular person's name on a website because if the person happens to be away, the information would go to the BSA coordinator and whoever is covering while she was, is away will have access to the information. I, I Fair enough, and then also just also seeing where you've weighed in is also part of it, so that's the reason for pushing for that. Uh, I wanna just echo the comments of uh, the, the zoning chair and the land use chair uh, regarding urban planners and their importance. I think it's an important expertise, and I, I believe you would agree with me that receiving, the train, re receiving a training here and there uh, short of an academic credential just isn't quite the same. Inez Dickens uh, is one of my favorite council members, now assembly member. She had been setting aside expense funding, which I've now started to do as well. So we have an urban planner that we fund out of city council expense who doesn't work for city planning, but has a duty just to community board 11 and community board six now. Uh, he's created a cottage industry. His name's George Janes. His name is in the Times every other week, challenging something. And uh, I, I urge my colleagues to set aside expense funding for each of their community boards with their respective colleagues to hire urban planners to work just on that. But um, introduction 732, which we, we introduced last year and uh, heard and what have you, would say that each community board should have a dedicated urban planner or even have them pooled, but I think what you're hearing across the board uh, is that um, there isn't any, but there is no urban planner at each community board who is looking at every zoning or BSA application, and I believe you would agree that when there's an urban planner like George Janes or another, going through, we're getting different results in the same situations. So I guess, would you be willing to either support the legislation when it's reintroduced or provide funding uh, or advocate for funding to actually give an urban planner dedicated to each community board where their client is the community board and they may end up opposing something that DCP or CPC is pushing or, or the mayor through ECF? Again, I would view that as a council prerogative, council member. <laughs> fair, fair enough, uh, but, but I, fair enough. Uh, in terms of your testimony, you talked about um, 
trying to limit parking. And what I can say is in a, th there's groups like Transportation Alternatives and, and Streets Pack and Full Disclosure, they've endorsed me and many of the people here. And one of the thoughts that we're looking at in urban planning is actually taking back the streets and rethinking the streets and saying, should the streets belong to five people who need a place to park their car? Or should we have loading and unloading in every single new building? Should we have parking in every new building? And as the future is coming very quickly, and we're looking at a future where people might actually be able to share cars, actually requiring that there be parking in buildings so that people can go, and there's a lot of jurisdictions where when you need to shop at a store, you go there, you park at a garage, the store validates your parking, and we could actually take the space that, if you look back in our history, the streets belonged to the people. There were no cars on the streets. There were push carts. That's where Macy's started. And so can we think about requiring parking and new construction, at least particularly in Manhattan, to and, and pull the parking off the street and widen our, our common spaces? I'm glad you mentioned that, council member. Um, while I was in Washington, D.C., a much more car-dependent city, I very reluctantly purchased a car and was so pleased in returning to New York to be able to get rid of it and once again be car-free. Um, me me too. <laughs> who needs one with a Metro card, right? Um, I, you raised lots of interesting ideas, and I think the key is going to be looking neighborhood by neighborhood, because obviously the Manhattan core is very, very different from the south shore of Staten Island. When we look at parking, um, at possible changes to parking requirements, it is in the context of transit-rich neighborhoods. Um, some of the things that you mentioned are the type of long-term thinking that we are engaged in. Um, something that you didn't mention, but that I do think will change the future use of our streets are increasingly autonomous vehicles. And as you know, council member, it's not an on-off switch. Vehicles are becoming increasingly more autonomous. Um, I think these are all useful planning issues in which to engage, and I welcome your work on it. So I, I think along that in terms of planning, in the budget, is it possible to start breaking out by project. I was really pleased during the mayor's town hall while you talked about uh, looking at closing loopholes. In my district, we have a situation where there's density of 10. It's the maximum allowed under law, 12 with affordable housing. Uh, we haven't really closed the loopholes that allow people to build luxury housing in my on the Upper East Side and then put the affordable housing component in Queens or in East Harlem. Uh, and uh, similarly, what we're seeing is that building that's 10 FAR that would normally be 20 stories tall and 210 feet, we, saw, we, we every, every day that goes by, we get another release from another developer that's figured out a way to make their building. The newest one is 370 feet tall uh, in, in where all the buildings surrounding it are under 200 feet. And uh, it, it, those are going to be ultra luxury units that I don't know anyone who can afford to live there. And I appreciate a commitment to trying to close the loopholes that allow people to get much taller. And I'm okay with height if it was 37 stories of affordable housing, but it's, I don't know how many stories of ultra luxury. So what is the timeline and how much funding do you have so that you can keep up with development? And I know that you prefer not to uh, respond to existing projects, but when you made your announcement in January, these projects hadn't been announced yet, and would love to get this done before another 20 projects are built. Thank you for the question, Council Member. It's something that you and I have discussed on a number of occasions, and I welcome the fact that you've brought a focus to this issue. Um, I would disagree with the characterization of this as a loophole. I think what has happened is that as building technologies have changed, the economics of construction have also changed, and we have found a number of proposed buildings that have surprised communities with respect to the shape of them. And as I committed, as the mayor committed at the town hall, this issue of it's um, in the shorthand called excessive voids is something that we are working with, uh, with other agencies to address. But I think we need to be clear that 
the issue is one where we need to take a long, hard look because there are so-called voids that we absolutely celebrate. We need to go no further than the municipal building with the soaring entryway. And so we know that our city deserves great architecture. We know that we've seen results that weren't anticipated. And so I will reiterate the commitment that we anticipate by the end of the year being able to have a nuanced approach to address the so-called excessive voids. I appreciate the end of the year. If it could be sooner, it would be great. Thank you.